you very much. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be in Cambridge and to work together with the Center for the Studies of Existential Risk. I met Hugh Price, Martin Rees, and Jan Tallinn, I think in 2014, as part of a discussion group at the German Federal Office. And I have been impressed uh, since then with how the center and team have expanded and managed to combine excellent research on existential risk with outreach and influence on this most important topic. I will talk today about the challenges and of evaluating extreme technological risk and other catastrophic risks in the area of public international law. And after an introduction, I will mention two current initiatives that show how states want to deal with the challenges of either minimizing extreme technological risks or protecting the environment in the 21st century. During the third part, I will present how gene drives are currently regulated by international law. Because of time constraints, I will not discuss my current work on international human rights and their potential to serve as a normative foundation to oblige states to evaluate and minimize existential risk in a proportional way. So extreme technological risks are usually transnational risks. And if damages are caused by these technologies, they will not be limited to the territory of one state. Hence, in an ideal world, there would be a coherent body of international law that would oblige states and private entities to evaluate and minimize extreme technological risks in a rational and proportional way. Furthermore, international law would lay the funda foundations for international and national bodies to implement these rules in a coherent way. But as we all know, even in the 21st century, we are very far away from an ideal world to say the least. There's no coherent body of international law that obliges states and private entities to evaluate technological risks. International law is fragmented. Different areas of international law, international environmental law, laws of war, human rights laws, um, trade law, investment protection law, etc., exist and are tailored to solve particular problems and there are, for instance, environmental law treaties protecting the ozone layer or the biodiversity or the marine environment. And every international treaty has to be interpreted according to its object and purpose. This means that lacuna, incoherences and frictions between different areas of international law and between different treaties are not astonishing, but based in the structure of international law. Besides, there is no clear hierarchy of rules. Apart from the Charter of the United Nations and the few rules of so-called jus cogens, peremptory norms, that possess a higher rank. This problem is worsened by the fact that there is no central court that can decide on every question of international law. There are diverse means of dispute settlement in and implementation, and there are different international courts courts, but even the International Court of Justice has only limited jurisdiction. What does this mean when looking at the topic of challenges of evaluation and ex uh, existential and catastrophic risks? Well, we can find different norm-based tools concerning how risks are diminished and or assessed within the domain of public international law according to the different areas of international law. These international norms developed because of the interests and values of like-minded states under specific historical conditions. But the bad news is states often react after a catastrophe has taken place. After the horror and cruelties of the Second World War, states were willing to create the United Nations. The UN Charter's aim is to diminish one of the most obvious existential risks, the use of force by states. Article 2, paragraph 4 reads, all members shall refrain, refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any manner, in any manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations, leaving as exceptions only the right to self-defense and the use of force authorized by the Security Council and I'm not going to comment on the airstrikes in Syria last week. 
The same is true with regard to the environmental protection. We had to wait until the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s for major international treaties which protect the environment to be concluded by states. Rather few exceptions exist in areas where reasonable and meaningful international law rules had been negotiated before major problems were manifest or an area was damaged, as for instance with regard to Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty was concluded 1959, or Outer Space, the Outer Space Treaty was concluded 1967. Let me say now a few words about two current initiatives that show how states want to deal with the challenges of either minimizing extreme technological risks or seek new legal approaches to protect the environment in the 21st century. First of all, states are discussing at the moment whether to negotiate a treaty limiting autonomous weapons. This April, states have been mentioned meeting for the fifth time since 2014 at the Convention on Conventional Weapons, CCW, in Geneva to discuss concerns over lethal autonomous weapons systems. And 82 states participated in this meeting, and a majority of states proposed that the parties of the to the Convention of Conventional Weapons agree in November this year to begin negotiations. The core of the debate is the concept of human control. States have discussed and will discuss what human control constitutes, and it's still unclear whether meaningful or appropriate or necessary or significant human control should be the decisive line. On the other hand, currently 26 states are calling for a ban on fully autonomous weapons as far as the NGO uh, Stop Killer Robots reports, including Austria and China. China, however, wants to limit the ban to the use of these weapons only, not including possession and development. On the other hand, five major actors even rejected moving to negotiate a new international treaty, and these are France, Israel, Russia, United Kingdom, and the United States, and here you see a working paper written by the delegation of the United States where they argue that uh, lethal autonomous weapons increase um, the, yeah, or, or decrease the possibility that civilians are killed. So, hence, it's very uncertain whether a meaningful treaty can be negotiated and concluded. The second initiative is very different as France is currently trying to start an initiative at the UN to negotiate a comprehensive global pact for the environment. The aim of the global pact is to create a unified body of environmental law as opposed to the current fragmented approach to international environmental issues. Hence, the global pact addresses the protection of the environment in general ways and seeks to bring legally binding effect to various soft law principles. The pact entails 26 articles and starts with a human right to an ecologically sound environment, Article 1, and a duty to take care of the environment, Article 2. Article 5 includes a principle of prevention, Article 6 a principle of precaution, as well as the polluter pays principle, so it's really, really broad. As the Globe Pact was heavily criticized by authors, and many states seem to be reluctant to support this initiative. I do not think, however, that there is a chance for negotiation or even more conclusion of such a universal treaty. But as these initiatives show, even today there are major loopholes in which areas are not regulated by international law. And one could add that there is no treaty limiting plastic waste whether this is an existential risk or not, no treaty governing chemicals in a comprehensive way. Um, there exist, however, very specific treaties, as for instance the 2013 Minamata Convention on Mercury. And there's no general treaty or soft law declaration on assessing, minimizing, or managing extreme technological risks. AI is not governed, governed by a specific international treaty. Neither is, for instance, geoengineering. Hence, as a first summary, one can conclude, as the international legal order is state-driven and fragmented, there's no coherent way of evaluating global catastrophic risks. The notions of risks and of existential and global catastrophic risks are unclear. It's unclear what level of uncertainty 
attached to a particular risk is accepted, duties to do an environmental impact assessment are laid down in international treaties, but they differ and cannot govern, for instance, cumulative risks. Questions of uncertainty and ethical challenges are tackled in different ways in different areas of public international law, and the same is true for the problem of priorization and decision-making by the states and the global community. However, at least some key values and common goods are protected by the international order in the 21st century, and these include inter alia the prohibition of the use of force, the protection of the environment, and the protection of human rights. And there are numerous international treaties governing these values. But, but besides the rules of the United Charter and of the, those of customary uh, law, no rules are universally binding. Often major actors are obliged by different treaties or not bound by international treaties at all. And in my third part, I want to exemplify these findings with regard to the international norms governing so-called gene drives. What are gene drives? Gene drives can be explained, and I learned this from my Max Planck colleague, Guy Reeves in Hamburg, as a collection of experimental techniques intended to be pushed to used uh, uh, sorry, intended to be used to push foreign genes into the chromosomes of wild populations. The principal proposed application of gene drives is to limit the capacity of wild animals to spread a disease. How does it work? Only a small proportion of descendants are likely to inherit an introduced gene without any drive properties. But however, a majority of surviving descendants inherit the introduced genes with drive properties. This is due to an engineered mechanism which favors its transmission to the next generation, and over generations this can result in all chromosomes in a population possessing the introduced gene. So gene drives could be seen as in, in, to constitute an existential risk because they are so-called low threshold drive systems. Only small numbers of individuals need to be released to start this drive process. At its theoretical extreme, only a single individual may be sufficient, including accidental release. As far as is, as is known, um, there are currently no field experiments involving gene drives, but this might change. For instance, the NGO target malaria um, is looking for ways to introduce gene drives uh, to prevent malaria. At the international level, the 2000 Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety to the Convention on Biological Diversity is the decisive international treaty. It entails binding rules for living modified organisms that may have adverse effect to the biological diversity. And the scope of the treaty is limited to living modified organisms resulting from modern bi biotechnology. The Cartagena Protocol in, is indisputably applicable if foreign DNA is integrated into the target's organism's genome. And this is the case with gene drive systems. So the primary aim of the treaty is to, quote, contribute to ensuring adequate level of protection in the field of the safe transfer, handling, and use of living modified organisms resulting from modern biotechnology. And this aim is in accordance with the important precautionary principle as a legal principle, which states that there were that where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. According to the Cartagena Protocol, when a party knows of an occurrence under its jurisdiction which may result in an uninternational transboundary movement of a living modified organism and is likely to have significant adverse effects on the conservation and on sustainable use of biological diversity, the party, the state, shall take appropriate measures to notify affected or potentially affected states as well as the biosafety clearinghouse. So each party shall adopt appropriate domestic measures aimed at preventing transboundary movements of LMOs. Apart from this, the so-called Advanced Informed Agreement, AIA, is governing the import of LMOs, but there is no moratorium or ban on gene drives. These rules bind only state parties. 
Having 171 parties, the Cartagena Protocol is an important international agreement for the regulation of living modified organisms, but relevant state actors such as the US have not signed or ratified the treaty. The same is true for the 2010 Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, which is applicable to gene drives too. After, an enter, uh, after entering into force on March um, 2018, the Kuala Lumpur Protocol has been binding state parties regarding questions of liability and redress if the transboundary movement of living modified organism has caused damage. Additionally, the Biological Weapons Convention is relevant in limiting gene drive systems as it prohibits the development of biological agents for non-peaceful purposes. To develop a gene drive system with the aim to use it as a weapon is prohibited. However, peaceful research is not limited by the Convention. Hence, problems of dual-use research of concern are not solved by the Bioweapons Convention and there is no implementation regime. This again shows the strengths and weaknesses of international law with regard to the evaluation of existential and global catastrophic risks. There is no coherent system, but major threats are outruled by international law norms. However, the rules have lacuna as they bind state parties only or not govern all relevant risks related to a specific technology or may not regulate a technology at all. Nevertheless, one should not underestimate the advantages of a risk assessment based on public international law, and this is a little bit uh, of optimism at the end. These advantages are in Taylor, that it is a global regime and is legally binding. Hence, it can be enforced by various means, including national and international courts. Non-anthropocentric goods and values, as for instance knowledge, or the environment are protected by existing rules of international law, by treaty law and customary law, especially human rights law, knowledge, and environmental law. A central element of current treaty law and, as most argue, customary law is the precautionary principle seeking to prevent env environmental degradation where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, even if there is no full scientific certainty. And rules of Customary international law today exists that provide answers for the question of state responsibility for causing or failing to prevent certain risks. As far as there are lacuna in international law, international treaties and soft law declarations can be negotiated today to govern developments in the very distant future, as for instance, superhuman AI the non-hierarchical structure of public international law and its fragmentation result in a flexibility to find rational and legitimate ways of evaluating existential and global catastrophic risks, as I hope. Thank you.